Okay, so today we're going to present um, gaming. Alright, that's why each of us we are in a particular gaming character's costume. So, um, Sabrina, I'm Mario. What do you think I am? Yes! I'm Ryu. Ryu from Street Fighter. And this is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm Confused Lara Croft from Tomb Raider. I lost you, Lara. Uh, I'm a Final Fantasy character. I'm Vivi the Wizard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why Vivi? Okay, so because of our presentation, we hope you enjoy yourself. Throughout human history, people have played games. As man's intellect and technology have evolved, so too have the games he plays. Games in North America, 
and it is the most uh, sorry, it's the most played game in North America, and it has over eight million players. Current generation of MMORPG include development of great group quest, use of instant dungeons, player-driven gameplay, production of movie tie-in games, and com and all this competition leads to potential profits among free-to-play MMORPGs. This is a screenshot of raiding in action. Okay, another current trend is mobile gaming. Mobile, ga mobile gaming take advantage of unique strengths of mobiles rather than <coughs> simply relying on basic idea of hotting popular franchises. Javier, boss of EA Mobile, said that phone is essential to uniting communities of players and the home consoles they currently play. The different types of mobile play gaming <coughs> includes multiplayer, content-based, high impact and high impact video games. They are categorized into embedded games, SMS games, and browser games. The last trend I'm going to talk about is in-game advertisements. It is the use of computer and video games as a medium to deliver, to deliver advertising. In 2005, the in-game advertising spending was USD 56 million, and it is expected, estimated to grow to 1.8 million by 2014. In-game advertising offers new and promising revenue, revenue stream, allowing developers to offset growing development costs and take more risk in gameplay. It brings extra one to one to two dollars profit per game until until sold towards publishers. That is, there will be significant increase over the current five to six dollars dollars profit per unit. Here are some examples of the in-game advertisements at in-game advertisements. Like Chupa Chups products can be seen in the background of 1992 computer game school. And an Adidas billboard is displayed in the foreground of the 1994 computer game FIFA International Soccer. <coughs> the poster campaign for Tripping the Reed can be found in the 2005 computer game SWAT 4. And Play characters are pictured in front of Media Island, Sony EMG's virtual presence in Second Life. Now I'll talk about the characteristics of game platform of the future. Firstly, it will arouse all five senses and it will be educational. In the future, games will be arousing all our five senses. Game developers will eventually capitalize on pain, sight, hear, taste and smell. For example, instead of hearing the sound of an explosion and seeing the its effects, a future gamer will feel the shock waves as well. DigiSense developed eye smell device that utilizes the sense of smell in future games. Next, gaming will be the future, educational will, um, aspect will be included in gaming in the future. Noel Felsen, a gaming industry Veterans said that when educational support is integrated with gaming, the didactic power of games will be realized. It will yield wide reaching social and educational benefits. Some of the serious games, like uh, the genres, are medical know how, current affairs, and national history. For example, Doom Remission it educates players on types of, cancer, of treatments available to for disease and importance of adhering to the prescribed therapy. This is used most, mostly for can cancer patients, for them to fight the disease. In the US, a more forceful power, a more a force more powerful teach play players non-violent ways of resolving res resolving conflicts. In Chicago, using computers, graphics and gaming to help promote education and physical activity. Dr. Michael Nelson, IBM Director of International of Internet Technology and Strategy, he states that video gaming offers a unique opportunity to reinforce the importance of math and science education. Kids love gaming, and math and science makes, makes games possible. Robin, Vice President of IBM Global Community Initiatives, said that gaming is opening many ways, many new and exciting options. Gaming technology is fun and helps us demonstrate that science and technology careers are fun and full of opportunities. Taking gaming technology to students is the perfect <coughs> next step in IBM's work to encourage students to stick with their math and science studies. 
In 2007, at least two schools in Singapore expected to introduce students, teachers, principals to the world of online gaming as part of the, cur the curriculum. We will be the first country in the world planning to use Granado Espada, a fantasy role-playing role a fantasy role-playing game allowing players to explore countries as they solve puzzles and hunt for treasure as a learning tool. So now you understand more of the game, this is a short game. After the three-year war, the land lies in ruin. Trade remains difficult and tensions run high. An uneasy truce lingers in the old world. And renewed conflict seems inevitable. A newly discovered land brings new hope and pioneers pour in to claim their share. But the great threat lies within. From legendary producer Haku Kim comes the grand winner of the prestigious Korean Game Awards with never before seen features. Control three characters at one time with MCC. Conquer the new world with extreme AI. Collect up to 36 playable characters. Experience high adventure in a 17th century Baroque world. Experience the revolution of Trinity. Experience Granado Espada. them to learn new skills like decision making and problem solving. I'll now talk about the gaming prospect. Graduates of DG, DG Penn Institute of Technology, recruited by Electronic Arts, Microsoft, Nintendo and Sony, earn up to US 50 million deve developing games. Oh, sorry, 50,000 <laughs> developing games. And people, listen up. The Computer Animation Programming School is setting up its Asian campus in Singapore, its first and only campus outside US. Uh, they offer specialized degree level courses for game development. The institute will be opening for fall 2007 in an area in Singapore called Fusion Police, an ambitious life work project that connects information technologies, communication and media industries. The courses they offer are as stated, Bachelor of Science in Real Life, Real-time interactive simulation and Bachelor of Fine Arts in production animation. So, any one of you are considering to change course? <laughs> okay, I'm now passing to Sabrina to talk about the global economy. Okay, so this is my avatar, um, Sammy Bailey. So now I talk about the virtual world of Second Life, for example. So, what's the definition of a virtual world? Uh, according to is a computer moderated persistent environment uh, true and if multiple individuals may interact simultaneously with each other. It is often an illusion that encourages the acceptance of familiar concepts such as place, inhabitant and object. It allows characters within virtual worlds to buy and sell virtual goods and the more people accept this illusion, the more real it becomes. So, um, when there's virtual world, there's virtual property. So these are the major and minor categories of virtual property. So in the major categories, we have objects such as weapons, armor, and jewelry. Characters, um, there's an avatar. Um, currency such as gold pieces, platinum pieces, and pyros. The minor categories are real estate such as houses, shops, building plots. Uh, you have accounts too. Then others such as permissions, memberships, and maps. So now I'll talk about the virtual gaming economy. So what's the definition of virtual gaming economy? It's an emergent economy existing in a virtual persistent world, usually in the context of an internet game. So it's usually found in MMORPGs such as EverQuest, Ultima Online, uh, well, World of Warcraft. 
and the stimulation games they are making Sims Online and Second Life. So they do have browser-based internet games, which are the new ads and token zone. Um, usually, these people can <coughs> the economy is used well. Go farming and power leveling, and also um, the trading of their items. So why does this economy exist? Because there's persistence in scarcity, specialization, trade, property rights, and because of the supply demand rule. So the largest virtual economy presently is Lineage um, in South Korea, where 70 billion users of all of Korea's population of 48 million people are playing with Lineage. So some examples of the immediate currency are WoW, where they have okay. gold, uh, Second Life with their million dollars, Mental Story with Menzos, and the rate is like with one million Menzos it goes to sing dollars, two dollars, and with EverQuest with their platinum piece, um, one platinum piece equals to US one cent. So these are the current current currency prices um, as of yesterday, 9th April. Um, that's actually Singapore time. US is actually later than uh, later than us. So that's the uh, average well uh well one thousand gold. Um, you can see the trend and different uh gaming <coughs> gaming um, websites, IG, gaming, Uber King and Game Hub. So followed by EQ which is EverQuest and EQ is the gold and the senior respectively. So this is the million dollar exchange for our second life. So also as of yesterday so we can see that um, it's rather quite high and these days about um it shoots over the seventy thousand US uh, seventy thousand in that dollar and about the exchange rate for US dollar and Indian dollar. So these are some of the websites where you can actually look for your um to exchange with uh, the currency prices is RPG S E or RPG Stock Exchange. Next one will be I on Mox where you can select the game and which server you are in and then um, you can update, see the updated graph. So you can trade items with real currency. So first you can trade with eBay, play options and item play. The items that you trade with are actually characters, weapons, armors, equipment, property and their, even their accounts too. So this is um, a screenshot from eBay. People signing off their second month public commando suit. Wow, nice. Yeah. So this is how they do it. I think it's uh this way is illegal actually because they're not supposed to sell all this stuff. Oh uh for Second Life it's since it's not a game, uh, eBay allows it. Then it's allowed. Yeah because, because like, wow they don't allow it. Yeah because wow wow is a game and the property all belongs to Blizzard. Oh. Uh, I'll actually talk about this in class about uh copyright of virtual property. In Second Life it's unique because you own you own what you create. Yeah. So here will be player options when player options that start. Uh, you can see there's ever quest. Um, yeah. And then next one will be underplay. This is a Korean website. It's very very popular. Some of the implications of virtual economy on our real economy. Um, business major business venture to various manufacturers like automakers such as Mercedes, um, Pontiac, uh, Toyota. They will shell out huge money over de developing prototype of autos. Because it's a cheaper option to actually design the autos initial model online and you can see the response um, whether people would like it and they will apply to the simulated design in real reality. The real world trade emerged around virtual access. Because of people trading for all this virtual property, they have become a um, real world trade. So, some gaming companies, a virtual companies are tropical in second life. Uh, they create buildings and design spaces for re other residents like swimming pools, shopping malls and night parks. Um, Korea is the first um, company to actually have its uh, virtual company in second life. Followed by Amira <coughs> to Rota, these are other examples. But Korea is the uh, first company to set up its own second life. So these are some of the major brands, the screenshots of uh, second life major brands. So we have Pontiac, Mercedes Benz, Sun Microsystem, BMW, Cast, Box of Comics, PMG, Toyota, and Scott City, and Vodafone. So um, one aspect of virtual economy is marketplation. It's a common tool of mark, marks, which is all the NMORPG and inflation. So it occurs when a more recently acquired 
item or introduced item makes an existing item lose its significant value. So now I talk about some famous core of game games. So these are the five most addictive games um, currently. So we have Grand Theft Auto, Sims, Championship Manager, Counter Strike, and the first on the list is War of Warcraft, which is a fantasy online role playing game. So 10 most important games of our lifetime, lifetime is Space Wars, Star Raiders, um, so on so forth, and there's also Mario, Warcraft, and Doom. So the US top 5 game sales are actually the Sims, uh, World of Warcraft, and usually the Sims and World of Warcraft. Uh, console, we have the new WII play, um, Pumpkins, Ghost Rapper, Advanced, World Fighter, and Major League Baseball on the top of the charts for console. So now talk about some extremes that gamers go to. So the common ones that people, uh, like normal gamers would do, like, uh, they go to Q-Builds, online auctions where they auction their stuff. They earn through gaming by selling their character, virtual as game assets, and they also created blogs and fan art sites. So this is one famous blogger. He, is, he, he said he's a gamer, a game addict. So he's a genius, but I got this from in Wikipedia. He was quite famous there. Yeah. So the com other common ones are they have online game forums, they purchase game books, and they research game tips on hacks, and um, there's also no farming. So the very extreme ones in, in World of Warcraft are they conduct funerals in game protests that like the naked ghosts in your readings. And this extreme um, in this uh, few divers they actually had skydiving while playing Super Mario, the Nintendo game. So Go farmers is now also becoming a job, let's say, uh, in, especially in China, where they have 12 hour shifts where they play computers by killing on screen monsters and raining backers and etc. These people have to dust to reach. So actually, I have this video to show you roughly how they actually how the China people in China actually exploit these poor game farmers. living conditions Reminds me of Fice Plaza or something. <laughs> <laughs> They get provided with food. They're eating. So the boss gives them food and lodging. It's not bad. Actually, you hear what they say, uh? they say you say something.
重要，但是赚钱之余开心也是重要的。三局一个先，三局一个先呀，三局我我觉得我也不能拉这帮老。这有一种成就感。
the dance dance revolution is in Singapore in like a few years back. It's a trend and students actually go to arcades to play it after school. They can they can do it for a few hours in a row. They can even have that there's this net that kid you can attach to your T V and you can do it at home. Well, like that dance revolution is actually there's a sensor to sense your movements of your hands. Well, the one that you get at home is just the fit movements. There was a uh, one that had para para dancing yeah, thing. Yeah, right? Okay. Another usefulness is that it actually can help stroke victims um, exercise. And when stroke victims play virtual reality games in which they imagine they were diving with shirts or snowboarding down a narrow slope, their ability to walk eventually improved. It's, this has been reported in a small study. Okay. Another thing that is used in the medical field is that surgeons who play games, their motor skills and hand coordination is actually better than those who did not play virtual <coughs> games. Like what Elin said earlier, there's this game that is used to help cancer patients. Now we're showing a video on how remission is formed by Hope Labs and how they develop this game. Very important for us to do good scientific research. We actually check to see whether this works. We make sure we have any impact. roll up their sleeves and they will just um, do whatever is necessary to meet our mission. When I think of the history of Hope Lab, I think most profoundly of the story of the Pams. Our board chair and founder, Pamela Midiar, and our founding president, Pamela Cato. And really the, the vision and the compassion and the intellect these two women brought to bear in this effort is phenomenal. I said, wouldn't it be great if you could um, have a video game where <coughs> kids with cancer could just blast the cancer cells? When we realized that we could fund this game fully ourselves and not worry about making a profit and really just do it for the kids, that's when Hope Lab started to come together. The game is a uh, 3D shooter that takes place <coughs> inside the human body. Uh, you take on the role of the microscopic yet intrepid nanobot named Roxy. You are armed with a chemo blaster and uh, rockets with medicine, and your mission <laughs> is to fight cancer and cancer related illnesses like infections on a cellular level. Well, one of the ways I describe this game is it's a cross between Tomb Raider and Fantastic Voyage, kind of a, a lone wolf uh, out to fight a tremendous enemy, but inside the human body. One of the challenges that we faced in developing this game was really trying to mesh the research that we were putting into the game up front along with the game developers and saying, hey, you guys have to communicate. We need all the scientific information to go into the game. We will help you translate it to put it in the game. The game developers are saying, hey, we want a fun, cool game. What is this stuff? It has a great potential to, to impact uh, adolescents in particular who uh, seem to have a lot of their interests focused on consumer electronics and on video games. It was exciting. You know, we do all these video games and the work is fun, but sometimes it's kind of pointless. I mean, there's no higher thing. It's just like immediate sort of entertainment and then it's forgettable with this one. So, uh, I think that actually explains how they actually come to the point to develop this game called Mission. Okay, thanks for explaining to you how uh, they actually have gaming uh, studies done on children who are burnt. And it actually helps them to relieve the pain they actually got distracted in the process of playing the game. Okay. What
what is sandbox game? It actually is an open-ended game that allows the users <coughs> to do anything they wish with the available game elements and within the limitations of the game engine. It's a mode of gameplay within the game that is more often played in a goal-directed manner. Okay, there are actually three major designs to the level designs of the sandbox game. Major sections of the game is actually sectioned off at the beginning of the game, and you get to go to that level along the way. It's actually open up after you have completed a certain part of the game in the beginning. Then, territory. Another most universal custom in sandbox game is that different sections of the map will be controlled by different factions. <coughs> it might be game, uh, gangs, armies, but many of these areas will be patrolled by hostile factions. It may be difficult to move through these areas, you will be often attacked, so you need to go arm and bring it back up. Okay. Another, another design is that there's a lot of hidden items within this gameplay. <coughs> These are some of the features of Sandbox Game. It's never ending gameplay. There's freedom to experiment, and it's not linear or non-existent plot. Okay, these are some of the examples of sandbox games. They are SimCity, The Sims, Second Life, Civilization Series, and Grand Theft Auto Series. Okay, now we are relating gameplay to media violence. According to Albert Bandura's social learning theory, a child will view violence as acceptable if the character receives rewards for being aggressive and hence imitate these actions. Okay, these are the two <coughs> different points that the media is actually teaching the kids nowadays.
uh, most players play for the ultimate chat room because they want to have the sense of being able to log on to the world. Uh, they form relationships <coughs> where um, they feel that they can find a helping hand that can maybe help them um, in fighting the character. Uh, some of them play with friends and family which um, they feel that brings them closer. Um, the guild and also teamwork um, where players work together and collaborate with others in a structured way. Next is immersion, um, the quest, where um, the story of the character goes into the story of the game. Um, role playing, identity exploration, exploration discovery, um, where people play to discover new things about the game. Um, knowledge, where players feel the accumulation of knowledge is rewarding. Um, fantasy and escapism where um, people want to live the reality world, that's why they play games. And then overall, um, people play because it's enjoyable, stimulating and provides decent entertainment. Um, yeah. Powerful with stories, actions and graphical features, sound effects and originality. Um, as I said, escapes from stress and gruesome reality, they can do the impossible, uh, which is beyond their imagination. And it brings a new level of excitement when people complete, eh, compete with each other. And because of gaming, there's the positive and the negative. Okay, the positive effects of gaming. Um, I have two videos, but I'll just show you one. The first one is on a, um, a, and a boy who has ADHD and uses game to help him on focus and concentrate on things. For 14 year old Jordan, going to school every day is more of a challenge than just learning lessons. He's been diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD. The real world can be overwhelming to kids with ADHD. Caught in a private world of sights and sounds, they're easily distracted and have trouble keeping their attention on one task. Stimulants like Ritalin can help, but leave many kids feeling anxious and jittery. Jordan had been on medications and been through all kinds of uh, psychotherapies, and it was getting very difficult for us. So I used to get calls from the school almost on a weekly basis towards his misbehaving in class, he's not paying attention. But thanks to a strategy originally devised for NASA pilots, Jordan's starting a new chapter in his life, all on a unique video game that's designed to train the user's mind. Biofeedback is essentially a method to show you what is going on in your body so that you can learn to control it voluntarily. Its supporters point to athletes, musicians, and even astronauts who have used the method to improve performance. Dr. Alan Pope hit on the video game idea by working with NASA pilots and flight simulators. The video games difficulty, the video games responsiveness to their inputs is adjusted according to what they're producing in brainwaves. When children produce the most desirable brainwaves, the skateboarder in the game speeds up, encouraging them to keep concentrating. Pope's controller can be plugged into popular off-the-shelf game systems so that kids can train with a new game whenever they need a change. Whether using traditional biofeedback or the new video game, all of the children studied made significant gains. They improved both their behavior and their ability to pay attention. But the kids who used video games were far more eager to show up at the clinic. After his biofeedback training, Jordan began behaving better in school. He recently brought home a perfect report card, straight A's. He's doing great in school. He's always on roll now, and I'm not getting the school calls anymore, and I'm liking life a lot better now. It may not be long until children with ADHD are told to study hard, get plenty of sleep, and play their video games. Well, that was great. Okay, so there was a video for the gaming for ADHD. Um, the next one is quite a long video. It's on um, how Iraq soldiers confront their traumatic memories of from the war. Uh, they not only use their sense of sight, their f um, touch, but they also use the smell um, when they put in 
um, petrol smell to for them to um, encounter what they got during the war in Iraq. Okay, on video video game therapy, it's used it's used for training and rehabilitation aid. Um, people with um, attentional difficulties like the ADHD we use now, um, traumatic brain injury like the Iraq war soldiers. If you want guys watch. Um, physiotherapy for arm injuries, um, occupational therapy, train movements and respiratory muscle. Um, gaming can also educate players. For example, um, uh, role play, where players take role of an avatar, um, can teach humanities. For example, geography and history that most of us would have done uh, when we were in secondary school. Um, and also calculation like math. Most of it is in primary schools. So. It's uh, social activities to mix around uh, with people where they might get to know someone of the same interest as a hobby. Um, stimulates imagination where players can do anything they want and it's cheap entertainment. Okay, it can also sharpen uh, mental faculties uh, where it can actually help young people develop uh, mental skills that will serve them in the adult, in the adult life. Uh, improves hand and eye coordination skills like problem solving skills, pattern recognition, um, estimating skills, reason judgment, uh, mimic social structure, uh, where players establish hierarchies of skills and ability. And other areas like attention, self-esteem, and video games are now implemented. Okay, the negative effects on gaming. Um, how many of you played games in school? In school? School, sir. Okay, they were definitely educational, right? Oh, and it's also fun, uh, it's just to get out of the curriculum. But parents these days are afraid that their children might get addicted because they don't know uh, what kind of games that they play because they don't do it when they were in schools. So I think that's what they're afraid of. I'll show you a video of um, uh, World of Warcraft edit. Teenager hooked on violent computer games. He's playing them an incredible 16 hours a day. His mother says his personality has changed and that he's become moody and violent, and his addiction is tearing the family apart. They don't realise how addictive it can be. It's a world of fantasy and fun. <laughs> But for 16-year-old Cameron Sandler, this is more than a game. It's an addiction and an illness. I am addicted to the game, but I'm not fully addicted. Like, I can quit whenever I want. That's what I kicks ass, doesn't it? It all started 18 months ago, when Cameron discovered World of Warcraft. Oh, now I'm going to kill you all. This never-ending computer game is played by millions around the globe. From America, Germany, China, all of Europe, England. And you've got friends in all of these places? Yeah. And that's what you refer to them as, your friends? Yeah. They play simultaneously for hours on end. Well, when you're fighting and killing their enemies. I don't know, I don't know why, I just eventually got addicted to it. Cameron has up to 500 players on his team, known as a guild. But the longest I've ever played for was 12 hours, and that was, um... Uh, that was um, just because the guild wanted me on for that long. Oh, you took my kill. Why do you talk with an American accent when you talk with these people? I don't know. It's probably like you move to a new country or something. You just end up picking it up. And that's not all he picked up. Sake. There's the tension and the violence. We get keyboards thrown around the room, or holes punched in the wall, or we'll go outside and smash bottles. Denise is Cameron's mum. He started off with this going for an hour, two hours, two hours turned into four, four turned into six, six turns into twelve, and he's now into the snowball effect that he's got to play that game. Cameron is often up at four in the morning to begin playing. Sometimes he goes right through the night. His mum estimates that on average, he's in front of that screen 16 hours a day. My choice to play it. Um, my choice to be addicted to it. Cameron reckons he can stand up and walk away, 
whenever he wants. But try telling that to his mum. Denise believes he's hooked. And just like an alcoholic, a smoker or a drug addict, getting off, beating the habit, is going to be an enormous challenge. Regardless of who's right and wrong in this household, experts are now warning that addiction to technology is becoming the fastest growing illness of the 21st century. No, his situation isn't rare at all. In fact, he's just the tip of probably a very undisclosed iceberg. Psychologist Edwina Cowdery and her colleagues are seeing more and more cases every day. The DSM-4, which is the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, basically it's the psychologist's bible of all the things that we're meant to know about, doesn't have internet addiction in it. I would suspect the next one does because of the amount of internet addiction in various forms for various ages that we're starting to see. Do you regret discovering this game? Mm, kind of taken a lot of time away from me. Um, I could have made up, you know, going out, exploring some more, meeting new people, but other than that, no, because I've gone and explored inside the game. I've met new people inside the game. Warcraft has had such an impact on players, there are chat rooms on the internet dedicated to addicts. An assistant professor from Harvard University claims up to 40% of users are hooked. And in China, a gifted 13-year-old student killed himself after playing Warcraft for 36 hours straight. The boy left a suicide note saying he wanted to join the heroes of the game he worshipped. It's a fantasy world. A bit like a book, but a book ends. I don't want to live like this anymore. I really don't. Yeah. Do you think people find it hard to believe the impact? I think so. I think so. I, I didn't think that a game would be this addictive to, to this point and change a personality. Cameron has left school and at the moment he isn't studying or working. He knows now is the time to tackle his addiction. It's no longer a game. How many parents do you think will be watching this story tonight and saying, that's me? I would say a lot. This is going to be a problem that we're going to be hearing a lot more about. Oh yes. Oh yes, big time. So as you can see, it's not only the players <coughs> affected, but the, the 